الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Brothers, indeed, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We praise Him, we seek His guidance, we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge only in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the evil within our actions. For whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, leaves misguided, none can guide. I bear this witness that there is none worthy of worship except our Creator, our Cherisher, our Sustainer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and I bear this witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the last and final messenger sent unto mankind to guide us from the depths of darkness, the darkness of Jahiliya and Kufr to the enlightenment of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invokes upon us to fear none but Allah. He subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the noble Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe, ittaqu Allah. Fear Allah, haqqa tukatihi, as it should be feared. وَلَا تَمُتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And do not die, do not depart this world, except in the state of Iman, except as a Muslim. Amongst the many noble ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us, Ya Ikhwani, وَإِن تُعْتِعْ أَكْثَرَ مِنَ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُدِلُّكَ عَنْ سَبِلِ اللَّهِ and if you were to follow, and if you, if you were to follow most of those who are on the earth, of a surety they will not fail to misguide you from the path of Allah. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a very strong confirmation amongst these other verses when we look at it. That after the revelation has been revealed, after the sharia has been given to you, the criterion for judgment is not to follow those who, may, who we may think are people of wisdom or ikmah, who set aside the sharia, who set aside the guidance from Allah and His Messenger. And we, conceptually we may agree with this, but in reality, in practical terms, we find ourselves struggling, individually and as a collective. Brothers, what I want us to concentrate upon when we hear verses like this are things like, do we now go by what the majority says? Do we look for harm and benefit and logic in something? Do we look for compromises and a gradual approach to achieve an end? Are these the approaches we're going to take? Because of surety that will mean that we compromise some of the text some of the Sharia. This will mean that the reality will dictate us and not the Sharia dictates the reality. This will mean that we will make usul, qawaid on the run. And there is a danger within which we fall. Because when we look at verses like where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the deen in the Allah in Islam that in the sight of Allah the only deen is only Islam and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَ فَلَا يُقْبَلَ مِنْ That whosoever desires a religion other than Islam, never will, it be, never will it be accepted of him. When we look at these verses, then we know of a surety that this deen is fixed, that only and only Islam as a criterion for judgment, Islam meaning the Sharia, the Quran and Sunnah, the words of Allah and His Messenger, are the only criteria for judgment when it comes to Islam, when it comes to our actions, when it comes to things and actions. And nothing else is accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing. And no amount of wisdom or hikmah can override the divine text. No amount of man-made, man-perceived, human-induced wisdom or hikmah based on reality, can override the divine text. And as for, the, as for the argument that often arises, that, you know, Allah didn't want to burden us. This is logic, yeah? 
Allah did not want us to burden ourselves, so we take a piecemeal approach, bit by bit, until we are ready. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows His creation better than creation itself. Al Khalik knows makhluk better than the makhluk himself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give us ahkam that will burden us unnecessarily. He knows the burden that Bani Adam can take. He knows Bani Adam can handle this burden. So Allah gave us this talab, gave us this request, gave us this ahkam. And so we cannot compromise on it. We cannot compromise on this. Theoretically, we make sense. We agree on the same platform. But in the practical sense, many a times we find ourselves in a brother, in brothers in a quagmire. Many a times we find ourselves stumbling over these conceptual issues. And when practical reality faces us, sometimes we choose the wrong path. And the tests that we face individually and as a collective ummah, we see unfolding, especially on a collective level, in front of us, almost on a daily basis. We've seen, we've seen in North Africa and the Middle East, the Ummah struggle for the Islam. The Ummah uprise, stage an uprising to grasp the Islam. We've seen the oppression of the Muslims in Myanmar, in, in Southeast Asia, in Myanmar. And the Muslims were, they were persecuted, burned, kicked out of the land. Nowhere to seek refuge, nowhere to find refuge. The Bangladeshi neighboring government denied them any refuge. The secular government under the Awami League in Bangladesh denied the Rohingya Muslims in, that were escaping Myanmar any refuge in their country, despite the fact they were Muslims. It is the same Bangladesh and same Bangladeshi government that we see meeting out oppression against his own Muslim citizens today. Over the last four weeks, we have seen Bangladesh in turmoil. We have seen masses on the streets. It all started off, Ya Ikhwani, when a group of secularists attacked Islam and the Prophet ﷺ very harshly. And the masses were affected by this. And so they poured onto the streets in protest, demanding justice, demanding the punishment system to be dealt with against these secularists who had attacked their Islam. And the attacks on Islam, brothers, were not cheap attacks. There were some serious ones. They called for the execution of ulama. They called for the execution of leading Islamic personalities to the extent where their kufr led them to say in their blogs that if Allah was to come down, we'll hang him too. That's how serious these attacks on the aqidah of Islam was. So why would not any Muslim who has a sincere aqidah be affected? Why would not they be? Why would not be? Why would they not be affected? But the secular government of Bangladesh, the Awami League-led party of Bangladesh. After, after one of the bloggers had been killed in the process, they gave him a national, a national janaza. And in the process, Sheikh Hasina, who happens to be the, the prime minister of the country, declared him a shaheed. And so this was another stab at the wounds of the Bangladeshi people. So they rose in thousands more in numbers to protest against this proclamation this pronouncing of Shaheed who had attacked Islam. And from then we saw brutality meted out by the police forces, where thousands have been beaten, where thousands have been injured, few, few have been killed, including a leading ulama from one of the mosques, have been killed. Brothers, the bloggers, the secularists, are in fact part of a community that used to be Muslim. When we see names like Asif Mohuddin, we see that their heritage, their inheritance has been Islamic. So the question arises in the mind, what happened? Somewhere down the track, they became Murtad. Somewhere down the track, they abandoned their Islam to the extent where they started to attack this. A country of 150 million people 
which is Bangladesh, a country of 150 million people has about 10% non-Muslims. And that means 15 million at least are non-Muslims. And of that, a good majority of them are Murtadeen, who are ex-Muslims. A good number of them. These are the criminals, brothers, who are praised by the secular regime of Bangladesh. They walk freely after attacking the Prophet ﷺ. What started in Denmark did not finish there. It carried on behind the scenes, outside from the eyes of the international media, away from the spotlight of the international media. Carried on. The attacks of the Prophet ﷺ has been, has been there for the last few years. We just did not see it until the masses started to uprise. The Muslims, when they demanded this punishment, were punished themselves. Those who defend the Prophet ﷺ face the brutality. Those who attacked the Prophet ﷺ and the deen of Allah were given refuge. SubhanAllah. This is the nature, the state of the Islam, of the Muslim lands today. Before Islam entered into Bangladesh, the country, the region itself, still known as Al Hind back then, was governed by dynasties of Buddhism and Hinduism. And these rival dynasties saw nothing but oppression of the masses. Their caste system, their, their oppressive, uh, oppressive regimes that led uh, humanity away from their own rights, from their basic rights, gave them a, a society, a civilization that was basically torn to bits, where father and son would be against each other. There was no harmony, there was no new unity, until Islam entered that land in the 13th century. And we saw the masses enter into Islam by the droves. Masses in Bangladesh, when Islam entered into it, entered into Islam by the droves. <coughs> Reverberating in our minds, it should. The verse that says, when you see the fat, the victory of, us, of, of Allah coming, and you see the masses entering into Islam by the droves, that's what happened in Bangladesh. And to this day, they have remained Muslims in majority. To this day. Then, of course, came the colonialist oppression of the Brits in the, in the mid to late 18th century until 1947 when they gave the independence to the area of the region of Al-Hind they put East Pakistan on one side and West Pakistan which is today's Pakistan on the other side and East Pakistan is today's Bangladesh but India which is a Kufr state right in the middle of them how could any unity exist how could any unity exist under those circumstances how uh, how can any, any unity exist under those circumstances? Then when in 1947, the independence movements arose, the very colonialists, the very colonialists that had given this partition aroused sectarianism, aroused nationalistic sentiments within the masses. They used their cultural, their linguistic differences, their inherited differences, and aroused a dispute amongst the two countries. They caused this division until massacres happened between the two Muslim nations. Until massacres were brought to the very existence of every nation, every individual that was living there. And some very horrendous crimes happened. And no one can say today that the Pakistani military acted with Islamic sentiments. No one can say today they did that. Because if you did care about your Muslim brothers, you would not raise a weapon against them. So on both sides, they were exploited by the Western colonialists to drive these nationalistic sentiments. And today, that very nationalistic sentiments exist in Bangladesh like it does in the rest of the world, like it does in the rest of the Islamic lands, right now, today. What we see, brothers, what we see after both Pakistan and Bangladesh had gained independence is that both these countries were ruled by corrupt rulers. None of them, none of them in these countries served the best interests of Islam. None of them gave to the masses what they called for when they formed Pakistan. Remember, it was East and West Pakistan. What did they call for? 
They call for Islam. The chant was, what is the meaning of Pakistan? And the message would say, La ilaha illallah. In other words, these countries were formed on the basis of Islam, but they never got their Islam. They got nationalistic movements. They got secular governments. They got corrupt, oppressive regimes. To the extent where the, where the masses today have moved from not only facing the daily oppression of not getting a job, not getting the opportunities <coughs> to study, not getting livelihood in their homes and lands, but the Al-Qaeda is under attack. And that's why we need to talk about these countries, Ya Ikhwani. Because our Al-Qaeda is under attack. And it is the duty of the Khatib to stand up and address these issues. When our Al-Qaeda is under attack, it is not just the Bangladeshi Al-Qaeda that's under attack. It is not just the Tunisian Al-Qaeda that's under attack. It's not just the Syrian Al-Qaeda that's under attack. It's the whole Muslim Ummah's Al-Qaeda that's under attack. This Al-Qaeda belongs to the Muslim Ummah. We are the safeguards. We are the vanguards of this deen. And so we must stand up in solidarity with the Bangladeshis, as we do with the Egyptians, as we do with the Tunisians, as we do with the Syrians, as we do with the Chechens, as we do with the Afghans, as we do with every Muslim suffering anywhere in this world. This is the meaning of Al-Muslim, Akhul Muslim. This is the meaning of Innam Al-Mu'minuna Ikhwa. But we did not get this brotherhood. No, we did not get this. What we got was, this, was a division. You see, Bangladesh this year will lead to an election here. And so the vying political forces are using divisions within the masses to secure their positions. As it does in many other countries in the world. And so what has happened is that to oust the Islamic movement from the political scene, the Awami League has stepped in and called for a nationalistic uprise of what happened in 1971. The struggle between East and West Bangladesh, East and West Pakistan back then. So it has aroused these sentiments within the masses. And it is this that is causing further demise of that country. And so these are testing times for the Ummah over there. And our solidarity must be with them only on the Islamic basis. Individually, the Bangladeshi people have one of two choices. One of two choices. You see, this country has been ruled primarily by two non-Islamic political parties. Primarily at the leadership. One is the BNP, the other is the Awami League. One's a nationalistic movement, one's a secular movement. And in between is the Islamic party called Jamaat Islam. And so this Jamaat Islami has formed coalition. So the masses will now need to go back to the Sharia individually and question if you are going to vote for a particular party, what does the, what does the Sharia say about this? Are they going to implement Islam individually? This is the obligation. Collectively, we as an Ummah, we as an Ummah now collectively, how do we support this case? How do we bring resolution to the, to the Muslims facing oppression, troubles anywhere in this world? Whether it's Burma, whether it's India, whether it's Pakistan itself, whether it's Bangladesh, whether it's the Middle East or the African countries. How? What we see is only oppression by the rulers who have served no interest to the Muslims. Their constitution, Ya Ikhwani, their constitution is more noble than the Qur'an. They safeguard the constitution more so than the Qur'an and Sunnah itself. And so as a collective ummah, we need to point out these corrupt rulers and remove them. Remove them, discard them in the dustbins of history. And appoint a khalifa for ourselves. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Brothers in addition to the verses that I quoted I quoted the verse in adina inda allahi al-islam wa man yabtaghi ghayra al-islam adina islam adina fala yukbala minhum that only deen in the sight of Allah is islam not secularism 
not democracy, not nothing, not capitalism, nothing. That whosoever accepts a deen, these are deens, creeds, aqidah, qawaif, these are deens of the people, of the masses people have brought forth over time, civilizations. That when we see this, that the deen in the sight of Allah is only Islam, that we must stick by it, we must stand by it. In addition to those verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ السَّبِيلِ That Allah will not give the kuffar away over the believers. There's two ways to look at it. That Allah will not allow it, so we sit back and relax. But we know that the verse says, Allah will not change the circumstances of the people until we change what is within those people. Or we say to ourselves, this verse means that if Allah will not allow it, how can we allow it? It's hakam shari here. Here one is hakam shari for action. One just mental understanding of the verse. No, it carries a hakam here in this, in this case. That's the stronger opinion. That if Allah Azawajal will not allow the kuffar away over believers, then how can we allow it? And if we do allow it, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? They will never fail to corrupt you. As I said in the first verse. Now think about it, brothers. With all due respect I have to the sincere Muslims in the Islamic political parties anywhere in this world, especially in this context here, Bangladesh, with all due respect to the ulama, with all due respect to the Islamic policies, what did they achieve, we have to ask, by joining hands with the BNP? They joined hands. Did they not follow? Did they not follow those who are around them? When you form a coalition with a non-Islamic party whose fundamentals are not built on the Quran and Sunnah, what's going to happen? You do luka ansabilillah. You will be misguided. You will be misguided from the right path. Let me test this, this. After so many years in government, your representation was to bring Islam to Bangladesh. But turn around and Islam is under attack in Bangladesh. Turn around today and people are losing their lives because they have to stand up and defend the Aqidah in Bangladesh. And this situation happens all over the world. Whether it's Bangladesh or Pakistan or anywhere. Any Islamic party, political party, that joins hands with the Kufr political party, this is what's going to happen. And this is exactly what's happened. Today, there's a struggle for Islam in Bangladesh. It's almost in a civil war kind of a situation. It's a serious issue. It's a serious issue. What should we take from this today? The central point of my khutbah today is this. We live at a time, Ya Ikhwani, where we should be over getting up to pray and fast. This should be easy now. Don't tell me that we should be talking about Salah and Salman and Zakat. No, there is a struggle for Islam in all over the world. This requires collective action. This requires a united Ummah action. Whether you live in this part of the world or you live in any part of the world. Because these are times when we see, when we will see a resurgence of colonialism of our lands. When we will see vying Western interests coming back to reinstate their colonialist dictators over us. Colonialist dictators that will safeguard secularism and kufr over our Islam. Isn't that what's happening all over the world? Isn't that what happened? Isn't that what happened in Egypt, in Syria, in most of the Muslim lands? And so as the dictators age, as the gap between the ruler and the rule get further, as masses now resurge and come back and want their Islam, these dictators will be on shaky ground. So there will be a concerted effort to bring back new dictators in new forms to govern us by a system of kufr. And this is what we need to be aware of. This is the take home message for today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sincerely guide us to the right path, to the deen of haq, to the path that will give not only the Muslims but the rest of humanity that salvation Allah Azza wa Jal has promised. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بارك على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد 
ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وفي العذاب النار ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تخملنا ما لا تعافط لنا به واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا